And there we are. Hello, folks. Give it out. And here we are. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of uh, Comic Shop Talk, brought to you by Black Cat Comics in Rockin' Mill Pitas. Buy online at black-cat-comics.com. I'm your host, Mark Causey. This is my co-host. Francie. And uh, welcome to, uh, like I say, another episode. We're here to uh, keep you connected with the comic book community. This is an interactive event, so feel free to uh, throw us your questions and participate, all that kind of good stuff. We're just here to help you have fun uh, during these pandemic times. Maybe you're sheltered in place, uh, whatever your current situation is. It's a crazy world, so we're here to bring you a little levity, a little fun, a little comic book activity. Uh, today, our topic is conventions. This is my uh, lanyard from last year's San Diego Comic-Con. Um, mm -hmm. This weekend would have been WonderCon down in Orange County, one of our favorite, favorite shows for a number of reasons. Uh, so we thought it would be fun to uh, take a walk through uh, down memory lane, talk about some of our favorite shows, some of your favorite shows, the things we like to do at conventions. We've got some show and tell for you. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so like I say, this is interactive. Uh, feel free to throw the questions out there. You're live here with us. And uh, we're going to have a call-in time. We yes. posted the phone number. So, like I say, get those convention stories ready. Call in. This is a full-on talk show. It uh, is. But before we get to the convention stuff, uh, like I say, there is a – now on to comic shop news. Biddly, 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 <laughs> comic <laughs> news. Uh, there are no new comics this week. If uh, you're a regular comic fan, you know that uh, Diamond Comics Distributors is uh, on hiatus at the moment. Uh, but what we've been talking about is all the million and one things that you can do while you're waiting for the new issue of your favorite title. Uh, we've been encouraging you guys to uh, catch up on your current reading. Uh, been encouraging you to revisit some of your favorite stuff. Been encouraging you to organize your stuff, get those things bagged and boarded, uh, uh, boxed up, uh, get your list updated, uh, figure out what holes you need, figure out those things that you might have missed, get those things on your mm -hmm. list. Um, and, uh, and of course, if you, if, and when you've done all those things, uh, then go to black dash cat, black dash cat dash comics.com. It's a tongue twister. It is a little bit and buy yourself something awesome. Uh, check out a new publisher, a new title, a new character, a new writer, a new artist. There is always, always something new to you in the hundred years of, uh, the comics have been running. New so, uh, that's our little spiel, yes. uh, for, for again, ways that you can be having fun while you're waiting for your, your new title to commence. So, uh, on to today's topic. Oh, one quick note. Um, so I just finished putting up a bunch of horror books to our, on our online shop store. So if you're like me, um, the pandemic's not scary enough. You want to consume and absorb more and more horror books. So I've got all the Joe Hill books that we have in stock up. I've got, um, Hellblazers up. I've got all the Hellboys that we have in stock up. Um, all the deceased that we have in stock is up now. So make sure you check them out because it's super scary fun. While we're on that topic, give me just a second to rip through my spiel of recommendations. Uh, first of all, all this stuff that you see behind up, me uh, is, is up on the site and available for order. So uh, <clears throat> when you're not looking at her pretty face, you can be looking at the books back there and saying, uh, hey, I want that book. And you can order those books. So there's that. Um, Keep on. the other thing I, uh, always like to have recommendations and I brought just uh, a few, I'm just going to rip through them. Wait, wait, just wait before he gets into that. I just have to say a shout out to Josh Frankel on Facebook. He is the artist that created the black cat logo, which we love. So shout out to Josh. We love Josh. Thank What's you, up, Josh. Josh. Thanks for joining okay, us. Okay, now continue. Um, so we've been talking about all kinds of things that folks can do. Um, uh, whether you're an old school fan, new school fan, you love comics forever, you don't know anything about comics. Up, uh, just been throwing some things out there that anybody can pick up and read and have fun with. I mm -hmm. um, always like to show a little bit of everybody. So Marvel Legacy number one was a really cool, fun one shot, and it got kind of panned. You know, they made this whole big deal out of it. Um, and, and, you know, like a lot of things in comics, the, the negative Nellies, uh, encouraged people not to check it out, but I thought it was a great read. It was a lot of fun. Again, anybody, anybody can read this book and have a lot well, of fun with it. And another side note, we've got like a hundred. So please, for the love of Jesus, baby <laughs> Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Get some of those Marvel legacies. Uh, Marvel Comics 1000 one. uh, was a really, really great, uh, again, it's two comics, but you really only need this one. Uh, you, 
to, to get the gist of it. Uh, 80 different creators, 80 years of comics, on and on and on I could go, but Marvel Comics 1000, super fun, fun book to read. And C CJ, you know, I'm a DC gal too, but that was actually a really good book. So I'm getting uh, to the DC well, I'm just stuff. saying, it's a good book for DC fans that are a little intimidated or not really that stoked on Marvel. Um, on a side note, one thing I like to say, again, 80 different creative teams yeah, in good. this book. Uh, so it's you good. will find an artist, a new artist, a new writer that you think is really awesome in a book like that. Dr. Doom Volume 1 just came out a couple weeks ago. Uh, Dr. Doom, the second greatest villain in it's comics. Favorite, yeah. um, you knew I had to throw an FF book. I just like it. It's a Volume 1. It's a great jumping point. It's an excellent, excellent book. It's brand new. It's a lot favorite? of fun. Why so much. Um, he, because behind the Joker, he's the greatest villain in comics. Well, why? Uh, why? Because, because he's everything the hero is and maybe a little more. Uh, he has a goal that is sort of defendable. Um, I, I don't know. He's very layered. It's very um, racial goal that way. He's, uh, there's, there's, there's many, many things to Dr. Doom and he's just an excellent, excellent villain. And that book will show you why. Another, my last Marvel is Savage Avengers volume one. Uh, love me anything Avengers. This one's dark. It's it's heavy, but I mean, come on, Conan, Punisher, Wolverine, <laughs> all in the same book. Really, really awesome. Like great stories, great art. Justice League Dark. Um, it is kind of Justice League Dark. It was was a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, so that's newer Marvel things that you can jump You're into. Right, C CJ was a lame name. What's that? It was a lame ass name. You said what was? I think the Marvel Legacy. I'm guessing. Oh, uh, I think Savage Avengers is awesome. Okay, so with DC, I'm going a little more classic. A quick point I wanted to make to the new folks. If you if they put it on TV or if they put it in a movie or if they made an animated series about it, it's probably awesome. This is Crisis on Infinite Earths. Uh, it's the good. big DC TV thing that they've been Super doing. Um, anybody, anybody, anybody should and uh, could and should read this book. Chock full of George Perez art doesn't get any greater than George Perez. Also to that point is Flashpoint. I guess no pun intended. Uh, again, if they made an animated series about it, it's probably pretty cool. Uh, if you liked the animated movie, pick up the book because the book is always better than the movie, right? Uh, and Fables, Fables, really quick, just to show you that DC does a whole lot more than the superhero stuff. Bill Wellingham is uh, is our one of our all-time, all-time favorites. Fables is an all-time, all-time great book. Um, so Fables. And, and a lot of the classic Vertigo, Why the Last Man, all those other kinds of things. I put things. all the Hellblazers up, so um, check those out. The other guys, uh, and I'm trying to be really quick with this, Betty and Veronica, been talking up a lot of uh, Archie stuff, been talking up everything Archie, the old school, all ages stuff, the new school stuff, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Betty and Veronica is always awesome. They're awesome on their own. They're awesome when they team up with uh, Red Sonia and Vampirella. And they're awesome when they team up with Harley and Ivy. Everybody is more awesome when they team up with Harley and Ivy. Uh, so get your Betty and Veronica in all kinds of different ways. Uh, and you mentioned Hellboy on the site earlier. Got to throw out some BPRD. This is the Shout big old omnibus of BPRD. Uh, again, uh, such fantastic genre fusion. It's superhero, it's action adventure, it's horror, it's sword and sorcery, uh, maybe even a little romance. BPRD has everything that you want in a book. Usagi Ojimbo. Uh, is one of those books that will show you what comics can really be. Uh, anybody, anybody should be reading Usagi Ojimbo. This is a life-changing sort of book. Right. And last but not least is Bloodshot. This is the omnibus edition of Volume 1. Is the movie out? The movie is, like, I don't know, straight to, straight home to, or to streaming or... or I don't know, maybe Valiant can tune in and, and let us know. But either way, Vin Diesel's got the movie. Everybody's talking Bloodshot. Pick up Bloodshot. So, uh, oh, sorry. Last but not least, my it's sister's been more. mentioning the All Ages. We're going to go ages. in a range of All Ages stuff from Little Golden, golden Books. books Everybody awesome. loves Little Golden Books. There's a million different ones. So check out Little Golden Books for you and for the young reader. The Marvel Action stuff. Been talking up the Marvel Action, Marvel IDW stuff. Love me team books like Avengers that allow a young reader to find the character that they like rather than being told to like well, a specific character. What's nice about these is for the most part, they're all shot. So you don't have to like read them in a series or get them in order. Like they're all self-contained. The one you got is it and frozen, frozen to go along with like flashpoint and stuff. If there's a movie, if there's oh a, anything that your kid oh likes, they make a comic book for that thing. Yeah. Um, so there you go. That is my. Uh, There's the commercial part. That's the commercial part of the these week. are things that you can uh, and all the stuff sure back here, of course, 
uh, pick it all up, check it all out. Anybody uh, should find something new, fun, and exciting in the world of comics. So yes. that is uh, Comic Shop News. And now for, uh, like I say, fun talk. The topic for today is uh, comic conventions. And uh, there's big shows, there's small shows. There aren't any shows, shows right now because shows, uh, all the shows are canceled. Shows. So, so we're bringing them at you. That's right. Um, I've talked enough. Why don't you uh, bring us into the topic of conventions? Well, so let's tell them a little bit about um, how long we've been going and which conventions we've gone to. So we start, you've been going a little bit longer than me. You started in like 94, 95. Mm -hmm. And then I started, we started going to San Diego together in 96, I think was the first San Diego Comic Con. Yep. And we've been to every San Diego Comic Con since. We've been to almost all of the Wonder Cons. This is We've my been to first WonderCon program from 1995. Moving into the show and tell portion of today. Art by Sergio Aragones. We've gone to, we just recently went to Chicago for the first time. So C2E2. We've been to Seattle multiple times. That was super fun. We did New York Comic Con two years ago, which was mm -hmm. amazing. So we've done Anaheim. We've done Seattle, New York, Chicago. All the local ones here. All the local. Shout out to Joe for San Jose T Time Tunnel Toy Show. San Jose Super Toy um, Show. Steve Wyatt for all the big wows in the, the East Bay Comic Con. East Bay and before the first year of Silicon Valley um, Comic Con. So we, we we've been at, we've been around a little bit. We know a little bit, and we've seen some crazy stuff. So we're going to share some of the craziest stuff with y'all today. Yep. Uh, like she said, we've been doing this a long time. Big shows, We're small old. shows. You can't tell. There's a lot uh, of gray in here. There's no there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, which is kind of harsh because I've got a, a picture in the show and tell portion that has me with hair. And everybody's going to be like, who's that guy? That's not you. Anyway. Um, so conventions are a ton of fun. There's a thousand things to do at the shows, um, things that you can't do at your local shop. And we've got two creators. So Josh and Emo have both exhibited at San Diego and I'm sure multiple shows beyond that. So if you guys have stories you want to share, get ready to dial in. So we're going to put you on the phone, put you on speaker so everyone can hear about your your. Horror stories, happy stories, crazy stories. All the things in between. Everything in between. Um, I go to, boy, let's see. Go, starting all the way back at the beginning. I started going to shows for the reason that everybody starts going to shows. Now is to buy old comics. Uh, uh, not everybody goes to buy old comics. At the beginning, that was the only reason to go to shows. The only thing at well, shows was see, old comics. Well, to see artists. Those and guys writers. weren't there yet. <laughs> That's what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, In the oh, beginning, oh. the only reason to go to a convention was be was to buy old comics. Um, and then when uh, people actually showed up to these things to buy old comics. Then the show guys started bringing in people to the shows and all like that. So, uh, I started going because I needed old Avengers comics and, and, you know, you only have access to so many comic shops. So you go to the convention, uh, cause there's more comics at the shows than at the shops. Um, and then, like you say, then, uh, it starts branching out. Um, and you start getting to the bigger shows uh, where all the artists are and the publishers are and, and all that kind of thing. And the whole dynamic changes. I started going, my number one thing in San Diego used to be, along with vintage comics, vintage toys. Um, it was the only place where I could find 60s, 70s action figures, uh, original Mego stuff, original Star Wars stuff, things like that. Um, and I have to put a pause there. I have to ask you a question. So knowing that you've grown up with comics, you started reading at the age of four with comics, and the first comic book store you went to was like what? And you were thirteen or mm -hmm. something. Comics, Castle. and it just blew your blew you away. So, what was the Kazi four year old experience of walking into a convention for the first time? So it's like ten stores at once. Uh, it was a hundred. Okay, so my first first show uh, was probably uh, was in East Bay Comic Con, one of Steve's things uh, back when he did it in Hayward. So that wouldn't have been quite the thing that show was more like i'm talking about more the 14 year old me yeah, yeah. where i walked into a room of boxes of boxes of boxes of boxes of comics and i knew i would be able to find frank miller daredevils and and john Byrne x-men's and things like that uh and and so that didn't necessarily ring the bell for the four to eight year old me but it definitely definitely hooked the 14 year old me yeah uh who at the time was like 25 uh what you're talking about is our first san diego experience 
uh, the first time we went to San Diego Comic Con, and again, it was a very different world. But even at the time, emo started going in '93. So oh, there you go. Beat us He's by a few uh, years. yeah, beat us by a couple of years. So the first time I went in, I remember this just crystal clear. Was you know, you get your ticket and your programming and all that kind of thing, and then you get to the door. And when I stepped in the door, the first thing I thought, and, and I mean this literally and seriously that for me personally, this would be what heaven looked like. I, I, I walked in the door and I couldn't see the other side, couldn't see any end of the room. The room I was in was, was limitless. And it was nothing but uh, comic books, action figures, games, blah, blah, blah. And so- Not so, a lot of cosplay yet. Uh, no, that, that wasn't really a thing yet. So, so like I say, I will always, always remember the first moment of, of walking in the door at San Diego Comic-Con because that was the, that was what the four five, six year old me always envisioned, always wanted uh, was to be let loose in, a, in an endless room full of comics and toys. Um, and to this day, I still kind of get that feeling. Comic-Con has very much changed. There's nowhere near the vintage, anything that there used to be. Uh, but it's still tons and tons and tons of fun, and I'm still always super excited to be there. CJ wants to know if you still have the books that um, from when you were still. Yes, I indeed I do. Uh, my collection sadly has been stolen from more than once. What's up, Marcus? Uh, there's my man. Uh, my collection has been stolen from a couple of times, um, once rather severely, uh, but most of that has been replaced. And I do indeed have the very first. I had two comics. Um, Marcus knows this. I yes, talk about it all the time. Um, Doc Savage number eight and Call the Destroyer number 13 were two comics that I got from my brother uh, and I still have them. Um, and in fact, I put them up back here uh, every once in a while just for people who want to buy my, my and first comics. And he's lugged them around the country. I've every had place them since 1974. They're just, yeah. Um, learned to read with that Doc Savage book, as a matter of fact. Um, and, and so, like I say, that's why we, we started going to cons. Um, I, I uh, went to WonderCon and uh, scored a giant stack of comics and uh, was talking her ear off when Ugh. she picked me up that day. And she asked me what the biggest convention, what the best convention in the world was. And I said, San Diego Comic-Con. And next year we went to San Diego. That was I said, 96. well, why don't we go? And he's like, marry me. And I said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, like I say, we've been going to Comic Con you too, guys. Uh, as many of the shows as we can get to ever since. Um, really quick, to and and this is where you all come in because everybody has gets something different out of shows. Everybody yeah. goes to shows for something different. She and I go to shows for very different totally things. Different. Uh, again, I go for old books. I go for these books. That's still that's why I started going. That's the only reason. Uh, go for the panels. Uh, I go. Um, but but there's there's the meet and greets, there's the panels, there's the cosplay, there's there's just thousands of reasons why people go to shows. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of my favorite experiences, whatever. Uh, but but please throw those things out there. I know my man Michael likes to go to all the panels. He and I go to the Kirby. Uh, uh, what am I? Was the Kirby tribute Tech panel Kirby every year, all that kind of stuff. So so that's always fun too. And, and so Emo has asked the difference between East and West Coast conventions, and we might save that towards the end. But Emo, if you want to chime in, because you've probably been to, um, actually, I don't know how many East Coast ones you've been to, but we'll, we'll definitely talk about the difference. It's honestly, hmm, I'll talk about it now. It's not so much the difference between East and West. It's, I think, more of a difference between Read Pop and Comic Con. So Read Pop is the company that does Seattle Comic Con. C2E2 and New York Comic Con. And so those are very similar in flavor. They're very similar in the panels and the level of guests and the, and the floor and the exhibit hall. Um, West Coast, it, you know, San Diego and WonderCon are done by Comic Con. And so that's got a different flavor. As far as like books go, um, the, the convention halls are all pretty much the same across the board, no matter West Coast, East Coast, big or small. Um, the types of books, like we saw a lot of books on the East Coast and like in Chicago recently that we don't ever see here and vice versa. So I think like the demand for certain books is different based on the, your geographic location. You know, maybe there's a, a huge shop out there that can do a lot more Silver Age Avengers or something. I don't know. But there's the, there's there's a slight difference in the, in the kinds of Silver Age books that we're, we're buying in the store 
here, here versus Seattle. Seattle is like the best place to get Silver Age books versus Chicago versus New York. New York stuff was more, it's kind of like, you know, here locally, we've got like the heroes cons where it's like, uh, you pay 150 bucks and you get like an autograph for, to see someone from star Wars or something like that. There's a lot more of that. It feels like at New York comic con, but there's still plenty of comic specific panels. There's still plenty of um, comics to shop. Um, in fact, I'd like to think that East coast might have more silver age books That's definitely true. than San east Diego and WonderCon. maybe comparable to Seattle. Cause there's a lot of shops up in Seattle. I, I agree with that. Uh, I would only add to that, or not even add so much, expand on that, um, is there's a regional thing to shows. Yeah. There's there's a regional thing to uh, the <laughs> the guest list. You know, uh, New York has its its bunch of guys, and, and, and so those are the guys so, you see on the East Coast. Madison Square Garden. They, like, have stuff, panels at the Madison Square Garden in New York. Like, yeah, how cool is that, that? That was awesome. Oh, my God. Um, so, so there's regional differences in the in the people that go to the shows, and regional differences in the kind of books that you see. Um, and eighty percent of it's the same. But by and large, so like I, said, I would say, the big details are the same. The little details change. Mm -hmm. I, I think is is a is a good way to to uh -huh. say that. Um, and it depends. The geographic location depends on which creators and writers and artists and stars will come. Like if it's. You know, no offense to Oklahoma, I don't think you're going to get a lot of people from Hollywood showing up to your conventions. But New York and San Diego have a plethora of big name folks from Hollywood. Um, New York was very TV, and San Diego is is very oh yeah, movies. That's a good way to look at um, it. That was one big thing I saw. Yeah, Amazon um, Prime stuff, uh, uh, Marvel Studio stuff on Netflix. A lot yep. of the streaming stuff was big in in uh, New York. Um. And I would imagine a lot of the the little shows are are, are again very very regional. Um, he says, oh. uh, "Imagine you're on death row, and the last wish they grant you is read one last comic. What would it be?" Uh, Dizzy's Max, I think that's how you say that. Um, let's see. I'll I'll answer that question with two John Byrne Fantastic Four books. Um, you go ahead. Uh, the first is the 20th anniversary issue 236 is my favorite comic book of all time. So in a pinch with a bullet to my head, I will always read Fantastic Four 236. However, I had to, it reminded me of an interesting story. Uh, Fantastic Four 233 is a comic about a guy on death row. So maybe oh. I, I might reread Fantastic Four 233 so that I could feel like, uh, like the guy in that story. Way to reach. Um, I don't know the issue numbers because I never memorize issue numbers. Don't don't hate me for that. Um, but it's the Midsummer Night's Dream Sandman edition of Shakespeare. That's like my favorite Sandman story of all time. So that's the one I would read um, with my last dying breath. There you go. Okay, back to conventions. Fun question. Um, okay, so uh, those Should were. I tell? Like I say, the yeah, our history of shows. Yeah. We've been going to twenty five years and going to the big ones, the small ones. Oh. Um, let's show some of our gems. Uh, again, when you go to shows, oh, you see things, you have access to things that you just can't get anywhere else, especially in the days before the internet, and even still in these days of the internet, you get things like Well You can't get that on the internet. I mean, okay. So there's a story behind this. Those of you who've gone to San Diego, you know what this is. This is the little placard that they put on the table to say, you know, in front of the speakers um, for our panels. So I have many, many Neil Gaiman stories, and they're all awesome. And you've probably heard me say them once or twice before. The one that I'll share, because I think it just share, it t talks about his character, is um, he was at San Diego. I don't remember how many years ago it was. And we were heading back home. We're at the airport. And those of you who know San Diego Airport, tiny, 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 tiny. Um, we were getting ready at our gate for a plane, and I hear this British accent behind me. And I look up, and it's Neil Gaiman and his family, you know, getting ready to get on a different plane, but very close gate. And I just happened to be reading the book that I just got from him, which was interwoven. And so I just kind of, you know, I was reading, and he was just kind of sitting right across from me. And when he kind of looked in my direction, I just kind of, held up the book of his that I'm reading. He nodded and I nodded and I went back. 
I wasn't going to be one of those fans that's like, oh my God, I need an autograph. Like he wasn't at con. He's at the airport. He's with his family. He's off limits. He's off the clock. But, you know, I just want to acknowledge, hey, dude, you know, I'm reading your book. I think you're awesome. So I keep reading my book, but I'm really just reading the same line because I'm like, oh my God, that's no game. And oh my God, that's no game. And so I hear behind me, would you like me to sign that for you? And I look up and he's right behind me. He's like, here, give me a pen. And he reached over, signed the book and said, thank you. And I said, thank you. And I basically became a puddle and he went <laughs> on to um, his plane as my, my favorite story of all time. Awesome. And yes, I swiped this from a panel. Um, can I tell the late night reading yes. story? Um, I'll steal another one of her Neil Gaiman stories uh, because this also speaks to his character. Um, so again, many, many years ago, uh, he was the featured guest at, at Comic-Con and uh, he was doing a million things for charity for the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. That um, if you don't know what the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund is, Google it, send them money, all those good things. Uh, so, so Neil Gaiman was raising money for the comic book legal defense fund. He was doing an auction. Uh, you would bid. And if you won the auction, he would read live, uh, at a panel, uh, whichever story you wanted, you were basically paying him to read you a story. Um, and so all kinds of people bid and they raised all kinds of money. Um, for some reason, uh, and I believe this is probably still true and it was certainly true at the time. Um, I don't think he quite grasped how beloved he really is. Uh, and so he just sort of threw this out there and he was inundated, uh, with requests. So, uh, we went to the panel to, to listen to him read these stories and he read a whole bunch of short stories. The point of the story is it went on and on and on and on. And he was reading morning, story something? after story after story. I, I remember it being 2 a.m. He was getting hoarse. And we're all like people were asleep. Kind of uh, stay awake. And yes, everybody's so like awesome. fighting to stay awake. And 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 he so would finish good. his story and he'd look up at the three so people still awake and he'd be like, Do you want me to read another one? Uh so anyway, I, I found it nothing but class uh to to show up and and uh do hours and hours and hours of, of reading for your fans. Neil Gaiman is top, top notch. If he comes to your city, you best be going and getting a ticket. That's all I got to say. It's uh, worth every dime. Yep, worth every dime. Um, okay, so more show and tell. So this, CJ will like, well, and Marcus too, hopefully. CJ and Marcus will get on Real like quick, no, Marcus, she didn't steal it. It was given to her. No, I totally stole it. Well. A little of both. I, you were in the process okay, of stealing so, it. Well. <laughs> when the lady gave it to you. <laughs> The panel was over. I walked up and started grabbing it. And there was one of the Comic-Con women there. I'm like, is it okay if I take this? She's like, yeah, go ahead. So I'm like, walk. There you go. So yes, you're right. Okay. So one of the other things I like, so this was from Seattle Comic-Con. What's it called? Is it just called Seattle Comic-Con? Emerald City Comic-Con. That's right. That's right. ECCC. So one of the wonderful things about Seattle is they've got this amazing artist alley, which is like, as, as big as the ex exhibition floor, just filled with huge name, you know, writers, artists. Best talent. artist alley in the business. Because a lot of them live in that area. So mm -hmm. you get everybody like, you know, Mark Wade's there and um, Gail Simone's there. And, you know, of course, Tom King goes and all that stuff. So one of my favorite guys um, is Ben Templesmith. And he had this portrait. I've never seen him do anything but the Cal McDonald story horror stuff. So he did this, um, fat man, whoa, the glare. Let's see, get the camera right. There you go. So you can see that and I'll show it to you guys on YouTube. And it's just amazing. And I got to talk to him and chat and he was just lovely and very kind. For a guy that draws really scary horror stuff, he's a super nice guy. So it was nice to get to, get to know him and to, to meet him. The horror guys are always strangely nice uh, i always feel like they have a refrigerator hello. with bodies in it just a recon and his comics hello you got now it's your turn um my turn okay and if any of you want to call in with your stories you can call now 408-942-6903 so uh i'm gonna cut to a couple of big guns um when I started going to Comic-Con, I could not believe the level of people that they brought to these things. Yeah. Um, 
Awesome, Emo. Emo, you 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 just uh, you gave me my segue. He said the first time at San Diego Comic Con, I met Stan Lee walking up the brick steps, walked into the those, convention doors, talking with him. Those are the best like moments. You just can't you can't. It's well worth the ticket price to just have those you know chance meetings with people. And uh, which brings me to my thing. So uh, when Emo my must be psychic. first years at Comic Con, we were at a panel, and and Stan Lee was on the panel. And uh, he had another panel to get to, so he was the first guy out the door, the front door of the of the room. So I headed out the back door of the room, figuring I could cut him off in the hall, which I did. And here's my picture. Wait, so thus the what we talked about before. There's me with hair. Who's um, that guy with hair? And that's that's me and the man himself. When you didn't have to pay a lot of money. Uh, and in the early Look how days of spry he looks, that Stan. I have uh, tons of pictures like this. I like you said earlier. I don't like to bug people for autographs. I don't like to take their time. I don't like to whatever. But almost anybody will stop for a picture. The cool people would always stop for a picture. So I'd say, "Hey, can I get a picture?" They say, "Yes." I smile, take the picture, move on. Uh, so I have this one with Stan. I have pictures of me with boy Alex Ross, uh, Peter David, just about anybody you can Before think of. Before selfies. Um, the other thing I did in the early years. Um, was get uh, autographs on your program. This is my 1997 Comic-Con program. And uh, obviously you got comics signed and stuff, but but back in the early days of con, the idea was that you got a program, you found your favorite <laughs> guy's page in the program, and they would, you know, sign that page. I wasn't terribly savvy, so I just kind of had them all sign on the one page. And on this page right here... There's five autographs on one page. Uh, most of you will recognize Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon. Um, most of you will recognize that John Romita Jr. Spider-Man sketch. If you're a 70s, 80s kid like me and you uh, grew up in the Hobgoblin era, you grew up in the uh, uh, Bob Layton, JRJR era of Iron Man, I uh, can't tell you what it meant to me to get that sketch on there. But... A couple of old guys will recognize that name up there, Dick Ayers. Dick Ayers is someone I like to call the other Kirby. I know that offends a lot of people, but that's just my own little personal thing. Don't hate on me. Dick Ayers is, is legendary. So anyway, like I say, there's a page Fine. with... Uh, oh, and that's Michael Moorcock over there, too, to round it all out. So... That's that's like five all time greats just on my old 1997 program. It's a, obviously a huge range of of, of eras and, and greats and whatever. It was just really fun back then to go up to a table and and tell them they were awesome and have them uh, sign your book for well, you. Well, and and so right now we could be in WonderCon, but we can't because of what's going on um, with the pandemic. So it's nice to go back to our souvenirs mm -hmm. and relive those memories. So hopefully you guys have that as well. You've got your your own stories, your own memories of um, exciting, fun times. Um, For sure. Conventions. And that's a big part of, you know, like I say about uh, reading arcs from your favorite stuff in your collection. You know, going back to revisit a lot of this stuff is is a huge part of having an awesome collection. And, and she's right. Since we can't go to the shows, uh, I, I really enjoyed going back through my program box and checking out all kinds of things. So recently I started, you know, so original art, I'm going to talk about original art for a second, because that's what you can get at co conventions is original art. Now, unless you're, you know, win the lotto, it's really expensive stuff. Um, so I, I splurged recently and just got some original art of some of my favorite fable stuff at um, South Bay Comic Con. East Bay? Or the South Bay. South Bay. Emo knows because Emo was there. And I actually got, I don't know if any fable fans are out there, but I got some original inking and art with um, Steve Lay Aloha of the Dark Man from Fables. And I'm just like in awe of it. And I still need to get it framed properly, but for now, I just love it. Love it. So a lot of people do go to conventions to get original art. Sure. And if you've got, you know, honestly, there's no better um, investment than original art. Especially yeah, if it's truth. someone that you, you absolutely love. Like if anyone on this panel can afford original Jack Kirby, more power to you. <laughs> that thing's only going to go up in value. Especially if you can find one at this point. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's that's super true. Uh, I, I 
well, this is a bit of a other topic, but uh, it's it's a big part of why I go to shows just to look at the original art pages, uh, just to look at, at at George Perez pages and then whatever those those things are are absolutely amazing. What else you got? Um, show and tell, show and tell. Well, I guess uh, I run a little something cool, something vintage that I used things I used to get at the shows. This is uh, the book and record of Fantastic Four That's number fun. one. Um, and I've got the little... Do they sing? Like, what is it? Um, a read-along? or It's is a read-along. It... So here's the record. 45 RPM with the big hole in it. If you're 100 years old like me, you know how to play these things. And yeah, the record is the book with sound effects and, and whatnot. Achoo, achoo, achoo. Um, and so you would read along. Wow, that's beautiful color. Um, show, show the folks. Um, oh. You'd read along while the record played. Wait, what's the age? How long old is that? This is probably 1974. Yep, 74, a year that comes up a lot when you I talk to me. I was a year me. old. Um, and so you'd read along and, and, and it would go boom, turn the page. And you'd turn the page and it would keep playing. Um, Lance and, had this when he was a kid. And say, nice. flip the record. Anyway, there's a whole mess of these, and this was the kind of thing. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you find at the San Jose Power Super Records. Toy Show. Yep, Power Records nice. presents. Uh, Darkness comes knows what I'm talking about. There's there's GI Joe. There's Planet of the Apes. There's superhero ones. There's all kinds of them. Uh, like I say, you go to the little shows like the San Jose Super Toy Show. You find cool stuff like this. You used to find stuff like uh, like this at WonderCon at Super at uh, San Diego Comic Con. And uh, again, aside from old comics, that's that's, that's a big, big Good. part of why I used to go to Comic Con is find vintage things like that. Um, so yeah, there's getting pictures of uh, your your favorite creators. There's original art stuff. There's things like this. For all you Disney fans out there, see if I can hold it still. This way. This way. And what you're supposed to do is go like this. Actually, is the room actually stretching? Well, this way. <laughs> or is it your imagination? Mm -hmm. Cool, huh? For those of you that don't know, this is the famous panel of the Haunted Mansion in Disneyland and redone in DC style characters. Tons of fun. And and on and on I could go. Um, again, a lot of these books is a big part of what I'm doing at shows, looking for keys like that first Spider-Woman, looking for books that are just fun to read, like all those Avengers stuff. Uh, that's that's also a big part of, of going to shows. So I have a couple more stories. I think I'll leave you to tell the Will Eisner one. I'll tell the Paul Dini one and, and Lance and, and CJ and Marcus, you've probably all heard this one before. So the year that his um, Batman, a true dark Knight tale came out. If you guys haven't read that, read it. If you've got people in your life that you love, buy it for them and give it to them. It's an amazing book. CJ, I hope you finish reading it. It's so, so good. Um, he was up for the Eisner's that year and he should have won in a, in a quick um, second. That book is an autobiographical book of when Paul Dini was working on Batman the Adventure, the animated, the animated series. series, he was mugged and it really messed up his face and it made him fearful and it was a real psychological, um, he went into depression, he had a lot of issues and he was very raw and honest in telling his story in the graphic novel form, which is Dark Knight, a true, a true Batman tale or something like that. And so anyway, he, he was up for the Eisners, he should have won. He didn't win and he didn't win. And you could tell on his face, like, cause we were at the Eisner's that night. You could just tell he felt kind of defeated cause he put his heart and his soul into that book. Fast forward the next day, we're on our way to like a Batman animated, I think, um, panel. And I'm riding up the elevator I'm kind of running late. I'm running late. And who is next to me on the elevator? I turn and it's freaking Paul Dini right there next to me on the escalator, getting to go into the same panel. And I said, you know, you know, Paul Dini, my name is Francie. I'm at comic book store, um, Black Cat Comics in Milpitas. All of our customers loved your book. I've sold 40 of them myself. I hand sold 40 because it's so important and so amazing. You should have won. I really appreciate it. It was very meaningful, honest and raw and, and brave. And he just looked at me and he, I could see wheels turning in his head and little tears behind his eyes. And he just said, thank you. Thank you. 
and he just kind of walked off and we went our separate ways. But it was so important as a fan to share mm -hmm. how their work is has had meaning and touched you in a deep way. Because yeah, it's just comics, right? But there's those rare moments where you like get a gut punch or or you're like an aha moment or you get inspired by something. And so being able to share that with the artist is just, it's priceless. And I'll never, hopefully never forget that moment. Um, I'll piggyback on, on that in two ways. One is with my own Paul Dini story, uh, really super quick. Uh, the also one of the million awesome things that can happen to you at con is I'm just diving in the back issue bin doing what I do and I uh, pull out a book to look at the cover uh, and it's an awesome cover and I'm looking at the book and the guy next to me I hear this voice say that one's really good you should buy that and I look over and it's Paul Dini oh, and when Paul dude. Dini says that's a good one you should buy that you buy that uh i was some batman book and it was awesome um he probably wrote it i don't know uh but but like i say you might just be hanging out buying a back issue and there's an all-time great standing right next to you uh giving you some advice the other thing i'll piggyback on that is to mention uh and i know a lot of you have heard me say this a thousand times one of the many many millions of people i love to talk to at shows for that reason is mark wade uh, I love to tell Mark Wade how awesome he is. I love to tell Mark Wade um, why I love his book so much. But more importantly, Mark Wade likes to ask people what they love about books. And, and Mark Wade uses these opportunities to talk to his fans uh, and get feedback from them, yeah. uh, which, which I really appreciate. Mark Wade cares what you think, and that's neat. Could you guys talk about any indie comics you have found while going to conventions? Um, sure. Um, though I, the one that comes to mind, I'm, I'm forgetting the title now, but the one Alex Ross did the cover for that I found at Ape. Um, let's see. Huh? Yeah. I'm trying to think. So there's Kabuki comes to mind. Number one, there's so many, um, great artists like yourself, emo, my buddy, Josh, who was on the Facebook live for a second, had his own indie comic well, um, and he, he would do, so he would do like zoological stuff, which is really cool. So almost like picture books without words of different, um, sea life and wildlife. Cause he was a zoologist and that was really, really awesome. Um, but yeah, there's, to be honest, we don't do much of it for the stores. We do it mostly for our personal collections. There's been, um, some really great horror indie books that I've picked up that are literally Handmade, stapled together, stuff on Jack the Ripper. Yeah, stuff on, that's um, for sure. Blah, blah, blah. Who's the axe murder chick? Come on. Axe murder chick? Come on, come on, come on. Everybody knows her. Um, anyway, the name escapes me. So there's there's a lot of like true crime stuff, indie books that I've picked up that I've really liked. But again, we don't do too much of it for the store. Um, I would also say it depends on, on what you consider an indie book. Uh, meaning I buy a lot of gold key, uh, classic gold. There you go. Lizzie Borden. Thank you. That's the axe murder chick. Love. Um, Brain uh, fart. I buy a lot of like gold key and Dell books, uh, which are not Marvel or DC, you know, old Magnus robot fighters and things like that, which were independent in the day. Uh, we buy a lot of Hellboy and things, a lot of dark horse, uh, which, which might be considered independent. Yeah. I mentioned like Kabuki, um, things, uh, Osagio Jimbo that I mentioned earlier. Um, the, the other thing I'd say really quick is the alternative press expo, which I don't even think is a thing anymore, but while we're on the subject of, of cons, I should mention the alternative press expo that used to be our that big indie awesome. thing. Yeah. Uh, we go to so the alternative fun. press expo and look for the, the next, uh, the next hot artist and darkness comes. These are, this is our personal stuff, but you might've missed me saying that I put up a bunch of horror books on our Shopify store. So there's a new tag that says horror. So you can check that out what we've got for sale. I did read it's a bird, but that's oh, yeah, been a little that while. Good. That was a cool, like real world Superman thing. If I recall. Yeah. And Marco and Arnell are sharing some stories about George Perez talking to him for a while. Stan Lee talking to him for a while. We have one of those with, um, Stranko, right? Or no, Ditko. Stranko. I always get him mixed up. Yeah, Ditko doesn't Who's go hair, anywhere or do anything. That's hair, Stranko. Stranko. He, ta he was talking about um, Masonic stuff and weird sacred geometry that he was putting in his in his work. 
Um, can't have the gold. Can't have the silver age without the golden age. Oh, he was he was amazing. He, he was, was he was amazing. A real incredibly tripper. cool. Um, but I would admit, and this was totally on me, not at all on him. I found myself needing to back out of this conversation, but being the only one at the table, so it was a little awkward. This Duranko handshake. Uh, he's just a, a really trippy guy. And I remember we were walking by the table and it was Jim Steranko and there's nobody there. And I was like, Oh, he's one of those guys that you got to talk to and tell him how awesome he is and all that. 10 minutes later, I was like, uh, I went in over my head. How do I get out of this? He was like showing me, I'm not intelligent. On, enough I think for this. it was on a, um, some Punisher art he was doing, um, the sacred geometry of like the pyramids and the triangles and how he's a Masonic and uh, Masonic guy and just all kinds of crazy stuff. And I, my mind is just like, what? Um, Blown. To this point, I, I'll say a couple of things really quick. Uh, one, like we say all the time, conventions are great places to meet uh, your this. favorite writers, artists, creators, all that kind of stuff. Get out to the shows and yeah. meet these people uh, for a number of reasons. One, it's super fun. And you meet people like Greg Rucka and then Rick Remender, the, the upcoming guys, the, the current greats, the, the all time greats. But, uh, and you know, a lot of these folks aren't around Tom forever. Um, and then, so you gotta, you gotta go to the shows. You gotta tell them what the work means to you. Yeah. Uh, you gotta, you gotta have that interaction with them. It's good for you. It's, it's good for them. Um, because, uh, one sec, the, in, as I went back, as I go back through that 1997 program, that program is full of people who aren't here anymore. Yeah. Uh, all time greats like Joe Kubert and, and all these Will things, Eisner. Will Eisner, uh, all kinds of all time greats, young guys like Michael Turner and Michael Ringo, um, uh, on and on and on. Sadly, we could go. And so, like I say, for, for a thousand reasons, good, bad and indifferent. I really, really encourage you folks to, to get out to the shows, uh, walk the floor, wait in those lines, meet these people uh, because it's fun. Um, it's it's personally rewarding and because you might not ever see these people again. So so there is a caveat and you guys probably know what I'm going to say next. Don't meet your heroes. It's not always great to meet your heroes. I'm not going to name any names, but you guys know who I'm talking about because we talk about it at the store all the time. Mm -hmm. There's There's some big name folks who a lot of us have idolized for you. Unfortunately, it's not always the best experience to meet your heroes. But when you do, and it's like and Neil Gaiman, and it's so nice, it, it, it adds to it. Like, wow, he really is cool, and he really does appreciate his fans. Well, I can say it's hugely rewarding. It makes, when you have those great experiences, it, it makes you like those books more. Um, Bill Willingham is one of those. Bye, we, Lance. Uh, thanks, Lance. Um, we, we talked to Bill Willingham one time and that was really, and on and on, weird. I could talk about, I could talk about everybody, uh, David Latham, um, on and on, uh, Todd McFarlane, on and on and on and on and on. Uh, but, but like I say, I just encourage you guys to, to get out there and meet those folks. Um, okay. So other than Neil Gaiman. So wait, Ema asked, do you feel most artists and creators are approachable then versus now, um, with how conventions are, you know, hmm. I'd say it's the same. Um, I think there's there's people who understand <laughs> why one should go to a show as an artist, and I think there's people that might not necessarily understand the effect that they have. Um, so I, I like to think it's the same. Um, and I'll, I'll break it down into three types really quick. Uh, there's the nice person who you're talking about, the approachable uh, person who's there to to engage with the fan. Uh, there's the uh, kind of not nice, maybe angry, bitter, stuck up something person. <laughs> That's, I'm just being honest. But my favorite, my personal favorite, you know who you are, is the one who's drawing <laughs> and doesn't even look up at me. Yeah. The the one who's because you know that that guy is serious about his work. Because I'm saying, hey, I have a store and I want to sell your stuff and make you money. And he doesn't care. He's too into that next line that he's working on. That is an artist. Well, and there's also, you got to remember, most artists and writers work solitary. Like they're working in their home by themselves. They don't get a lot of social interaction. And so having all these people come up to them and talking to them is really uncomfortable for them. And so it's not so much that they're mean or being dicks or anything it's just that they're it's un, it's a not natural setting for them to be in so you kind of got to give them a little bit of credit for that or a little bit of leeway 99.8 of all comic person uh comic people are socially awkward uh and that's that's another thing that makes conventions fun will eisner oh boy which will eisner story to tell, Did we tell him? uh 
Sure. Let me be a little general. Uh, San Diego Comic-Con has an event called the Eisner Awards. The Eisner Awards is the Academy Awards for comic books, uh, best writer, best artist, best everything under Inter the sun. Um, and stuff. for years and years and years and years, uh, Will Eisner himself um, sat and uh, on, a throne. on a throne and and did the uh, did the Eisners. Part of the Eisners is the uh, Retailer Award. Every year they uh, give an Eisner to uh, the Retailer of the Year. And uh, so part of that is... Uh, long story getting longer. Long story getting longer. W they would do retailer-only pan retailer panels. And so we would go to the retailer-only panels and Will Eisner... Not one for of the, the riffraff. Uh, one of the all-time great uh, creators of comics, uh, creator of the spirit and many other things, inventor of the graphic novel. That's, yes. that's, that's a very fair art. statement. Um, so anyway, Eisner would would come to this panel and he would tell readers what they or retailers what they could do to be better, um, and and we hung on his every word. Uh, Will Eisner was seventeen kinds of genius. Uh, he was inspiring. He was entertaining. Um, he was it was just great to he, be in his presence. He had more energy than I did. And I was like twenty five. Uh, he was ninety. We were yeah, we were very young at the time, and he was uh, fresh retailer. And Brand he new. was more energetic and had better Running ideas and, and everything. He was Will Eisner was was a singularly unique and incredibly talented human being, mm -hmm. um, and and deserving of of every compliment and accolade that he gets. Mm -hmm. uh, and like a lot of the people we're talking about. Um, the original Batman artist, uh, not Bill Finger. Um, uh, no, not Bill Finger. The other one. Bob Kane. Bo no, the other one. The third one. Help me, Marcus. Dick's, Dick's, um, uh, anyway, we would go to his pan. Robinson, James Robinson. Oh, Jerry Robinson. Jerry Robinson. Um, I'm going to get my comic book guy license revoked. Revoked. Uh, some of these guys, it was just an honor to be sitting in that room yeah. and listening to them talk and listening to them share their ideas. And again, that was a great, great part what of going to What things are like in the bullpen. Do you tell them what Will Eisner told us to do as retailers in that panel? Uh, take the name comics out of our title? Yeah, he really wanted all of us to become bookstores and to have it be genre-based. He's like, comic book stores are kind of a thing of the past. It's hard for new people off the street to come in and know what the heck they're doing because most stores should still have their stuff organized by public Sure. He's like, so you should have a make it a bookstore and have it be genre based. So horror section, a sci-fi section, romance section, you know, history section, all that kind of stuff. Um, which is really hard to do. <laughs> which is really hard to do. <laughs> we didn't really do that, but we listened to uh, we listen. everything else he had to say. Um, so so yeah, that was awesome. Miss you too, Jim. Um, walking up, behind team? Chewbacca that one time was awesome. Um, okay, so as okay. we get down to time on low on time, let's get to the last couple of things, guys. Throw your questions, your comments out there. Call in if you want. He did um, we're getting the down. Graphic novel. That's right. Um, yes, yes, he did. Um, so, uh, hardest question: uh, What's the coolest thing you ever scored at at a, oh. at a show? Mine's kind of easy, so so I'll let I'll let you go first. Well, I got if you know it, say it because I got to think about it. Uh, so my score was Avengers number four, uh, the first appearance of Captain America. Um, uh, I went to a table and I asked a guy what the lowest grade Avengers mm -hmm. four he had, and he showed me a low grade one. And I said, "Oh, do you have one even more beat up than this?" And he said, "Yes." And he gave me a really beat up copy for super cheap. And I walked around like this. Uh, with my Avengers number four, the first appearance of Captain America, because it was okay, awesome. Um, and that is uh, among many, 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 many great comics. I'm super uh, stoked to have gotten Avengers number four. Who right. do we have on the phone? We've got on the phone Daniel, and he's got a Comic-Con story that he wants to share. Go for it, Daniel. So uh, I'm going to share uh, my very and best uh, San Diego Comic-Con story because I've only ever had the privilege of going once. And I remember going to you guys the Wednesday before and telling you I had every intention of meeting Jim Lee and getting his autograph. Oh, right. And you guys looked at me with the most sternest faces, and you guys asked me, promise, promise us that you will not spend all day in that line. Promise us that you're going to walk the floor and, you know, try to take everything in because you only have one day. Mm -hmm. And I said to you that I would. And so I go to San Diego, and I go to the huge uh, – massive structure that is the DC booth and I'm just blown away and I had written down the perfect time when to 
get to the booth to see that if he was there. And as I walk up, I see, as of course, a huge line that's extending well into the hall. And I go up to one of the people in charge of the booth and I say, oh, um, is there anything needed to get Mr. Lee's uh, autograph? And they said, yeah, you need to pre-order a ticket, which, of course, I did not know. And remembering the promise that I made to you guys, I said, all right, well, I have all day and I'm just going to keep walking the floors because I was having the, uh, well, one of the best days of my life, really. I met Marshall (laughs) Vestry, who was super cool. I met Jim Chung, Mm -hmm. who, again, was super cool. Uh, and so, uh, because you guys have taught me well, before I left the show, I said, oh, I'm going to go, uh, dig into the short pins one more time just to see if there's any really good book that I missed. And I'm digging, I'm digging and digging. And of course, you know, you guys know me. Um, uh, I don't start at A, uh, we start at X as well. You get to get to X to get to X-Men and I'm digging through and all of a sudden I see, uh, an X-Men number two. You know, the glorious cover of Magneto uh, triumphantly uh, capturing Professor X. And all of a sudden, I see uh, a word written across the title in Sharpie. And I'm very close, and I see a J in there, and I see an L. And I look at it, and I say to myself, there's no way this can be true. And I look at the little sticker description, and it says, signed by Jim Lee. Yes. And Hope you guys can hear that okay. And I I took it to... uh, to the guys who were running the booth, uh, they were actually heroes uh, out, out in Campbell. And I and so I'd been there before. And so I walk up and I said, is this like Jim Lee, Jim Lee? And they laugh at me and they said, do you know of any other Jim Lee who worked on this? <laughs> and I was like, no. And I said, well, how much is this? And they said, oh, it's uh, 20 bucks. And I really thought that they were just playing some very elaborate practical joke on me. And then they proceed to tell me no. And not only that, but you got from our discount bin. So it's actually only going to be $15. Nice. And of course, you know, I was so happy. I spent five minutes just walking and looking at this thing going, wow, I finally did it. Finally got a Jim Lee autographed book. And not only that, it was an X-Men book. Thank God. And as I'm walking out, who do I see standing by himself of all people, but the man himself, Jim Lee. And normally I'm of the same belief, like, oh, like, you know, not at the table, you know, not doing the autograph thing. Like, you know, if you can leave him be, but I thought, you know what? It took me at least 15 years to try to get this to happen. So I'm just going to shoot my shot. I go up to him and I said, excuse me, Mr. Lee, can I uh, take a uh, picture with you? And he says, oh yeah, sure. Gladly. And he not to, not only took one, but he said, like, you know what, let's take a second one just in case. And, and I could have cartwheeled out of that place if I only knew how to cartwheel. Um, See, that's, and- that's the best thing about having, you know, being in the conventions is, like, you don't know what kind of miraculous things can happen and when. You know, it's just one of those, you know, right place, right time kind of things. Thanks for sharing that, Daniel. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Thanks again, guys, for convincing me not to stay in that line all day. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take care. Bye. That's a great story. That's that really actually kind of encapsulates everything Perfect. that we talk about. You know, uh, get down there, uh, get out to the shows, get out to the little shows, the big shows, whatever you can do. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money to have a good time. Uh, you just got to get in the door and uh, and enjoy yourself. Um, fun fact: Star Wars also premiered at San Diego Comic Con. That's true, and I really miss Star Wars Day in San Diego. If you are to add on to that, uh, there is a 1976 San Diego Comic Con Star Wars poster. There is a Star Wars poster from the year before the movie came out. George Lucas himself does not have one. Uh, he had he put a lot of effort to try and track one down. Uh, so if you are one of those people that attended Comic-Con in 1976, you might want to go through your stash and see if you got one. I'm sure it's priceless. Um, so that about wraps us up here. Uh, we like to keep the show to an hour. I think Daniel's story was a great place to to end end this. Thank you, Daniel, for sharing that. That Um, So like we say, uh, you know, there's a lot to, uh, going on here in the world of comics, uh, even during this new comic hiatus, uh, 
Um, you can find us uh, here every Wednesday and every Saturday. Uh, every Wednesday is our standard weekly video where we're showing you guys new, fun, cool things to read and things to new get to into. Uh, it's new to you these days. So that's every Wednesday. Every Saturday, we're here being the comic community, giving you a chance to uh, to, to hang out with, uh, with your comic shop people. Uh, so tune in next Saturday at 2 o'clock and keep up with us. Uh, I want to thank everybody that tunes in and, and is hanging out with us today. want to so really, much. really thank everybody that's uh, gone to black-cat-comics.com, uh, ordered some stuff, keep us going, keep us uh, open and surviving during these crazy times. We have gift cards now, too. Um, yes, we put gift cards online. So go to black-cat-comics.com, find yourself something cool and fun to read. Uh, keep up with these pages as we continue to entertain you. And we look forward to seeing you back in the store. Can't wait. As soon as possible. Uh, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye guys. Thanks.